Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to you all. From those down the road to the folks around the world, welcome back to another video talking once again about the influences on Darwin. Okay, so a quick recap. The local indigenous populations of the northern parts of Australia have lived there for well over 50,000 years. Then European explorers came over as of the 1600s. Firstly, it was the Dutch who decided to name parts of this northern coastline after various people and places in the Netherlands. Uh, Van Diemen's Land, the Gulf of Carpentaria and Arnhem Land, and the whole continent they called New Holland. Then in about 1839, the HMS Beagle, not with Charles Darwin, but with his two friends, John Lord Stokes and John Clement Wickens, saw what we now call the Darwin Harbour with its beautiful white cliffs and named it after their great friend, Charles Darwin. 1862 rolls around, John McDowell Stewart makes his trip up to the northern parts, and then in 1869, that's when the proper settlement of Darwin is built after a few failed attempts during that decade. During the 1870s and 1880s, there was a large community of Chinese immigrants, mostly from the Kwantung province of South China, that were coming to Darwin on cheap labour contracts. Now these contracts were mainly in the business of the mining industry, which there was a great boom as of 1872 onwards, uh, in the construction of some of the major buildings within Darwin, such as government residences, administrative buildings, hospitals, and such like. And then throughout the majority of the 1880s, the railway industry, connecting the uh, settlement of Palmerston, now Darwin, to the town of Pine Creek, which was known for its mining prowess and its mining uh, integrity. The first of these Chinese immigrants came to Darwin and the surrounding areas in 1874. They started to quickly outnumber the European populations within about four or five years. At its peak in 1888, there were roughly 6,000 Chinese immigrants living within Darwin and the surrounding areas. Now, comparatively, there were only 1,500 Europeans living within the same area. So for every one European, there were four Chinese immigrants living within Darwin and the Northern Territory. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit hostile. You see, ever since the Chinese demographic started to outnumber their European counterparts, there was an increase in anti-Chinese feeling and a number of national campaigns, especially that in the South Australian government. So why were the South Australians getting so upset by what was happening nearly a thousand kilometres away up in Palmerston, now Darwin? Well, you see, the South Australian government were technically running things up in their new Palmerston settlement. Palmerston had its own legislative council as of 1870, but it was the final decision of the South Australian government that actually made things happen in and around that settlement area. So in 1881, the South Australian government clearly defined where the border between itself and the Northern Territory was. And it taxed any Chinese immigrant 10 pounds to just cross over into the South Australian area. In the 1890s, there was a widespread economic depression not just within the confines of South Australia and the Northern Territory, but across the whole of the Australian nation, and also across America and Europe. In fact, it was a worldwide economic depression. Now, during that time, a lot of the anti-Chinese feelings became a lot stronger. And so a lot of the Chinese immigrants living within Darwin left the territory for better pastures elsewhere. Some stayed within Darwin and became citizens of Australia. That was, however, until 1901, when an already restrictive situation became nearly impenetrable. The all-white Australia policy ran from 1901 to 1973. and was a policy enforced by government trying to create an ethnically all-white nation. It began with the 1903 Act of Naturalisation, 
meaning that unless you had been born in Australia or had lived in the country for more than five years prior to 1903, it was very easy for you to get deported. And so only a few hundred Chinese immigrants were actually able to stay within the boundaries of the Australian nation. And it was very difficult for anybody from any nationality to actually emigrate to Australia either. But post World War II, there was an Australian labour shortage and 60 million displaced peoples from nations across the world, mostly from Southern and Eastern Europe. So the Australian government relaxed its rules just a little bit. And during the 1950s and 60s, the all white Australia policy was compared to the apartheid system in South Africa for its racial discrimination and its prejudices, especially against those from Asian and African backgrounds. But there was also a desire to change from the people on the ground and also the new generations of government coming into power. And so during that post-war period, the rules and the policy was chipped and ebbed away until, like I said, until about 1973, when it existed no longer. But with such an all-dominating societal policy, it would be not until the 1980s and early 90s before what we recognise as Australia today, the multicultural and diverse country that it is, would be start to, would, would start to be recognised. Now, despite that only 6% of Darwin's population comes from the Chinese community and the once proud Chinatown uh, of the early 20th century was bombed and never replaced uh, during the Second World War, the influence that this community has on the city of Darwin is still great and ever present. Chinese New Year is an often observed celebration within the city and there are many restaurants and community groups within Darwin that celebrate this widespread and influential community within the city. Another Asian community that is referenced in certain chronicles, uh, artworks and also in archaeological finds are the Makassan people who originated from the island of Sulawesi, which is now part of modern day Indonesia. The Makassans were coming to the northern parts of Australia to do what is known as trepanging. Now trepanging refers to the trepang, the sea cucumber. And what the Makassan people were doing was that they were harvesting and cultivating these sea cucumbers for foodstuffs. Within the chronicles of history, recorded by both European explorers, as well as the local clans people of the Northern Territory, including the Larakia, who were situated around what is now Darwin, they put that the Marcusons had been traveling to this Northern section of Australia since about the early 1700s. Unfortunately, due to various factors, especially uh, Australian government policy, the Marcuson people have not been able to trade or harvest the trepang sea cucumber since the early 20th century. But not all influences are the same. Some are built upon the development of a certain city or country, some are simply travelling in to trade and trepang the sea cucumbers. There are some influences that come from a much darker period, uh, political refugees or those escaping from war. In the decade following the Vietnam War, some 2,000 people made the perilous journey across the Pacific to the northern parts of Australia. They are often referred to as the small boat people because of the size of the craft that they were using and which would take them months to actually get from their home in Vietnam to northern coastlines. And then there are the refugees that came from the Timor Islands as Timor-Leste and East Timor had a war in the mid 1970s and specifically East Timor in the late 90s was in the grip of a civil war. Small Greek islanders also found their way to the Northern Territory uh, because of political unrest in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Greek communities found themselves in small odd jobs like in the meat factories or in local businesses but they also ended up in the construction industry for the railways 
uh, sort of post-World War I. And they also, a lot of them, found themselves in the pearling industry, which is the cultivation of uh, oyster pearls and the mother of pearl, which is the inside of the shell, and an industry that is still very, very profitable in certain parts of Australia. Another group of Greek refugees arrived in Darwin in the mid-1950s, their country having suffered greatly during the Second World War and a civil war following that. But this time, these Greek immigrants would find themselves in the construction industry. Darwin had equally suffered as a result of the Second World War and the bombing raids by the Japanese. And with Darwin in such a ruinous state, the Greeks were employed to rebuild this city of Darwin. Despite filling in a labour shortage in this post-war era, the Greeks were considered a less desirable community of people in Australia were emigrating to Australia, unlike the British. The Australians took in a number of Brits in the post-war era and considered themselves to be British subjects right up until 1984. Like I mentioned before, the all-white Australia policy was very discriminatory and prejudiced against those of African and Asian heritage, but was also rather not keen on anyone from Southern and Eastern Europe. But this labour shortage and 60 million displaced individuals relaxed those rules. And so those two communities of Southern and Eastern Europe were able to move and emigrate to Australia. Now, moving away from a largely controversial subject, the next influential group of people that lived in Darwin and influenced not only the city, but the centre as well, were the Afghan camelers. These Afghan camelers came from what is now called Pakistan, but was during the late 19th century, the area bordering uh, British India and Afghanistan. The Afghan camelers were brought over to Australia with their camels to majoritively service the Overland Telegraph Network, which was built between 1870 and 72, but of course needed constant maintenance and resources sent to their substations. It was one of the only ways of travelling through the centre of Australia, was via Afghan camelers. Of course, by the time you get to the early railway systems and then the Stuart Highway, which was built during the Second World War, these Afghan camelers became a rather redundant and uh, unnecessary service. But it remains that the Afghan camelers have influenced Darwin and, of course, the centre of Australia throughout that 70 year period between their arrival in 1870, 71, and of course, the Second World War. Finally, there is a Russian connection to the city of Darwin. In 1873, the Russian man Maurice Hotz brought his wife and three children to Darwin, escaping political unrest in his home nation. He had studied horticulture and botany in Germany and had been working in the Imperial Botanical Gardens of St. Petersburg. He was a well-educated man, speaking not only English and Russian, but Latin as well, and Greek too, which made for obviously the scientific work that he did. He started to work at the Botanical Gardens in Darwin under its founder, William Hayes, taking over in 1878 when Hayes died. He would move the gardens to Fa the Fanny Bay area of Darwin a year later in 1879, and then moved it to its present position by 1886. So there we have it. I hope that this video proves to you that Darwin has been influenced not by just its British founders and by the Australians in government, but by various nationalities across the world, from China, Russia, Greece, Vietnam, Timor, and many, many other nations as well. I hope this has been informative and I hope that you have enjoyed it. I also hope that you enjoyed the previous video that I made on the influences of Darwin. And if you haven't, please do go check that out when it comes up somewhere here. But for now, I will see you all next week for something different entirely. See you later.